and welcome to episode 28 of the Dream Hills 2 podcast. This week we talk about Brexit, the open cast mine going on possibly in San Miguel de Salinas and flooding. Oh, first off anyway, uh, Brexit. Uh, as we all know from March 29th next year we actually do in uh, technically leave the EU. Uh, some notices have been put out by the British government concerning uh, you know passports uh, driving and uh, actually tv as well and i'll get to that but the the most important one actually will be driving by the sounds of it uh, according to the uk government the some eu states may require an international driving permit which isn't free to be legal on their roads as well as their existing license Uh, As we all know, or you may not, the IDP is a document which, uh, when carried with your driving licence, means you'll be able to drive outside of the UK, including the EU countries. Now, quite amazingly, there are actually two types of IDP. Uh, There's the 1949 Geneva Convention on Road Traffic, but there's also the 1968 Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. The version of the IDP that you would require depends on which country you are going to visit and whether it is a party to the 1949 or the 1968 convention. The 1949 convention one lasts only for 12 months and after March 28th in the EU, a UK issued 1949 one would be recognised only in Ireland, Spain, Malta and Cyprus. The 1968 Convention International Driving Permit would be valid for three years or for however long your driving licence is valid if that date is earlier. The UK ratified the 1968 Convention on March 28, 2018 as part of its exit preparations. So the 1968 one would come into force on March 28, 2019 and after, after that date, a UK-issued 1968 convention one would be recognised in all other countries, plus Norway and Switzerland. After March, 29, March 2019, Britain's driving in an EU country, for example on holiday, would need both a UK driving licence and the appropriate IDP. If you are going to France and Spain, it's noted that you may need both of them. So the best bet is to uh, go for the 1968 one, as that one would cover all of the EU countries. Otherwise you would have to get the 1949 one and the 1968 one. From February 1st, 2019, the UK government will begin providing the international driving permits and you'll be able to get them from post office branches. They haven't actually notified anybody of when or which post office branches you'll be able to get these from, so we'll have to wait and see for that one. It also notes that if you become a resident in the EU country after exit day, you would not have the automatic right under EU law to exchange your UK licence for a driving licence from the EU country you're living in. As you know, at present, uh, if you do go to Spain and live there, you can exchange your driving licence without having taken any driving uh, test or anything at all. But depending on the laws of the EU country you move to, you may actually need to take a new driving test in that country. So if you want to avoid that, you know, you know try and exchange it uh, in Spain before March the 29th next year. Um, if you do do that and you then return back to the UK, you will be able to re-exchange it for a UK licence if you do return. The paper also notes that currently the UK government is seeking to negotiate a comprehensive agreement with the EU to cover the continued recognition and exchange of licences after exit. So you may not have to take a a driving test, but just be aware that uh, that could be a possibility. The UK government has also published a lengthy paper on the passports. Uh, After March the 29th, if there's no deal, British passport holders will be considered a third country national under the Schengen border code and will therefore need to comply with different rules to enter and travel around the Schengen area. According to the Schengen border code, third country passports must have been issued within the last 10 years uh, on the date of arrival in a Schengen country and have at least three months validity remaining on date of intended departure from the last country visited in the Schengen area. 
Because third country nationals can remain in the Schengen area for 90 days, the actual check carried out could be that the passport has at least six months validity remaining on the date of arrival. If you are planning to travel after March 29th next year and your passport will be affected by the new validity rules, we recommend that you can re- you consider renewing your passport soon to avoid any delay. Uh, also for children, if a child's passport does not meet these criteria, they may be denied entry into any of the Schengen area countries and you should renew their passport form before travel. Mobiles. Uh, mobile networks were forced to treat uh, use in any other UK countries as the same as if the customer was at home. Uh, it's possible that uh, a free roaming could no longer be guaranteed to any UK people if they uh, if there's no deal. Um, I can't really see that happening. Um, you, you never know, but uh, we'll see on that one. Uh, and TV. Uh, as it stands, broadcasters in the EU, EU can show their channels in any of the member states, but they only have to come under the scrutiny of one. So, for example, if the BBC wanted to show BBC programmes in France, it can do, but it only answers to the code of Ofcom in the UK and not the French equivalent. The country of origin principle, however, will disappear with a no-deal Brexit. That means that broadcasters will have to abide by the regulations in each country that they want to show their content in. So fairly comprehensive. Um, if you want to just sort of stop and, and listen to some of those, then feel free. Uh, any questions, and uh, I'll try and answer them in the, in the next episode. So now uh, we're on to the next one uh, that we're going to be talking about, uh, the flooding in the, uh, the Costa region. So uh, after a torrential rain brought flooding to the areas of South Alicante Province on Saturday, it was after a spectacular electrical storm. It kept many residents awake for much of the night. The heavens opened early in the morning, with several prolonged bursts of rain causing havoc in and around Torriaca town centre. The Guardia Civil had to temporarily close the N332, which as we know is one of the busiest roads in the country, close to the Ozone Commercial Centre, when the water became too deep for vehicles to pass on Saturday morning. Drivers themselves were diverted off of the road while the flood water was pumped away. In the same area, five motorists had to be rescued by firemen when their vehicles became stuck in rapidly rising water close to the Aquapolis Water Park and the Casa Grande Industrial Estate. Other areas which were often flooded during torrential rain were also affected, including the Rambla Juan Mateo, where the water cascades down to the Hibby Market, Areas of the Torretas and the El Limonar, where the flood water descends from the CV905 towards the Torreviaco Salt Lake, and the streets around the Playa de las Locos. Sections of beaches were also washed away as the flooded water created torrents running to the sea. The Projecto Mistral Weather Project reported that 45.4 litres per square metre of rain fell in Torreviaco, now, for those of you who don't know, that is quite a bit of rain, actually. Um, I'm not surprised places flooded there. As we do know, the the uh, irrigation and the, the drains around the Torreveca and the Oroela Costa area aren't the best, uh, and it does flood quite uh, quite a few times every time it rains heavily. Uh, most of the rain was actually channeled through the watercourses to the beaches, uh, and this is where the sand itself was washed away. Claro spokesman noted that the Cal Parana near the new Playas de Oroela Primary School was also flooded and he hit out at the infrastructure councillor Juan Ignacio Lopez Baz for announcing drainage works in the streets but not putting the projects out to tender. Well we all know with the, the, the Spanish uh, you know, local councils and stuff like that they're always arguing with each other but that does need to be uh, sorted out because you, you don't want that sort of area flooding around the school, really, as they've had quite a few problems around there as it is. So I uh, hope you're all safe there and no serious flooding has occurred around the area where you all live. And um, hopefully it's, it's clearing up now, apparently. And so, uh, you know, keep safe. It uh, does uh, get quite nasty there sometimes with the heavy rain and the thunder and lightning. So uh, on to the next story that we're kind of talking about here. And it's actually a bid for freedom from the Oruella town itself. 
Um, so I'll get on to that one and uh, see what you think. So the, the president of the Oruella Costa Party, Claro, Dr. Roman Jimenez, he's handed a 28-page report on the unfair council budget to Oruella Town Hall and warned their aim is to win autonomy from the city. Uh, the way they would do this is through the creation of a new governing body, an entidad local menor, which would give Oruella Costa a local mayor and some ruling powers. He says that uh, they don't think that the town of Oluera Costa can be ruled by the local government and council standing 33 kilometres away, he said. We are fed up of being treated as second-class citizens and not receiving the necessary funds to improve our lives. The report to the council includes a series of basic and long-demanding facilities and services for the coast, such as the emergency centre, which still hasn't been built or finished and uh, isn't likely to be very soon, a cultural centre with a library, an auditorium, rooms for social activities and a music and language school. They also called for an improvement to the local police and bus service, a halt to the Carla Mosca building scheme, repairs to the poor drainage system, referring back to that last news story about the flooding, a footbridge over the N332 at the Carla Mosca area, widening the bridge over the AP7 at Lomas de Cabo Roy, which I have touched upon in the past, uh, and it's basically there's no footpath there for uh, cyclists or for pedestrians to cross that bridge, and it can get quite dangerous. Also, they want to stop the issue of new building licences until the basic infrastructure and the services are provided. Just this week, the council has granted permission for another 21 detached villas with swimming pools in the Oruella Costa. doesn't say where it is, uh, but once again, it seems to be sort of flooding the market, uh, to be honest. Uh, at the same time, uh, Clara members have launched a campaign to make Oruella Costa residents aware of the importance of being registered on the municipal census, the Padron. Senor Jimenez said that this provides the official population figure which the authorities used when drawing up policies and allocating funding. According to the national statistics, a total of 32,530 people were registered in Oruella Costa in 2013, but the figure has fallen to 20,005 in 2018. He highlighted that a Padron certificate is needed to be eligible to vote in next May's local elections. However, it's still unclear whether British residents will be eligible to direct due to Brexit. The deadline to register on the Padron and to vote is December the 31st. He did stress that there would be no vote and no voice. So this one, it's, it's really a case of the Oruella Costa wanting to split from Oruella itself. Uh, as the as the the um, uh, the Claro Costa Party, uh, Roman Jimenez says, you, you know they they don't really give us a lot of money to do what we want to do. We like to improve things on the Oruella Costa for everybody, and it just doesn't happen. Uh, also, the building licenses they're all done by Oruella Town Hall itself, and not really Oruella Costa. So in effect, we have no say on what gets built where it gets built, uh, and how many get built. Uh, so let's see what happens with that one. Uh, it'll be good if it does happen, and uh, we'll see what uh, everybody thinks about that one, shall we? Okay, so on to the next one. It's the, the open cast mining that I was talking about last week. Um, it's concerning the, well, the search for gypsum. It's gypsum that they're searching for. Uh, I'll come on to that one now. So more than uh, 100 residents attended the Tuesday evening's meeting on the controversial gypsum prospecting and open cast mine plan for San Miguel de Salinas. This is uh, being done by the Spain's leading gypsum exporting company. The meeting was organised by the San Miguel Archangel Residents Association to make residents aware of the potential environmental and financial problems that the project could bring to the area. The association president, Manuel Gomez, has set up a committee uh, to plan coordinated actions to stop it. Residents watched a promotional video produced by the Piant Mining Company, which showed work of similar open cast mines. 
And so according to the proposal sent to the regional government, it covers a huge area of 1,400 he hectares in Man San Miguel de Salinas and Orihuela. And it's from the Camino de Balsa Road up to the Torre Estrala and the Ciudad de las Comunicaciones uh, urbanizations, which is also close to the Padera Reservoir. And also then down to the entrance of the town at the CV95 road to Orihuela. Senor Gomez pointed out that 1,065 hectares of the research and cast open, cast open cast mine area are on a special bird protection area and would destroy the habitat where the birds of prey hunt. And on that note there about a special bird protection area, now say what you think about the UK government and the UK as a whole most of the time, but if this was the UK, I don't think this would go ahead at all. Uh, it's you know it's a special bird protection area uh, in the UK. If that was the case, there, there'd be uproar if anything like that happened. But uh, you know, in Spain, it's it, a lot of it's about money, um, and I'm fortunate there that uh, the birds of prey that hunt in that area uh, would actually you know not in, be able to do that anymore because it'd actually destroy the habitat in the area. Uh, he also highlighted that it would seriously damage the farming tourism building and business interests in the town he warned the site he warned that the site was one of the main farming areas in the municipality and that around 100 families would lose their jobs moreover residents in the ciudad de las comunicaciones and torre estrella will have to deal with the noise of controlled explosions dust and heavy lorries and machinery working near their homes now, some of you may think, well, why are we talking about this uh, as it's in the San Miguel area? Well, as we know, if you actually go on your roofs in the Dream Hills 2 area, you can see the town of San Miguel. And it is quite a possibility that you will see, if this open cast mine does go ahead, you'll see the, the dust being up in the air and in the, everywhere. Also, you may even hear the explosions. Um, we don't know. Yeah, we may not do, but uh, it won't be very nice driving around the San Miguel area with explosions going on for the open cast mining and other things, dust uh, and heavy lorries. So, uh, yeah, if, if you want to, you can actually join uh, being part of the committee or volunteering as a liaison between the Spanish and the expat communi community. Uh, and you can go onto their Facebook page, the Association de Vecinos San Miguel Archangel, or by phone on 96-572-03-51. You can also t send an email to AVVS, uh, sorry, AVV San Miguel at, at yahoo.es or attend the association, of association offices at the Cal 19 de Abril 47 in San Miguel. As I said, the... Uh, you know, we may not be affected by this, but you know, we don't really want a load of noise and dust and uh, explosions going on in the area in the, the summertime. It's, it won't be nice. Um, uh, hopefully this doesn't go ahead. We're now going to go on to uh, Bumper Summer for Tory, according to the papers. So let's get on to that one. So the uh, the population of Torrevieja rose to an estimated 423,000 people during the peak summer season, according to the information provided by the town hall. Deputy Mayor Fanny Serrano revealed this week that the figure is based on water consumption in the municipality. So she says it's impossible for the town hall to provide exact numbers because most of the tourists who visit the municipality stay in holiday homes many of which are not registered with the regional government and do not appear on official records, so illegal ones. Um, however, Senor Serrano, uh, sorry, uh, Senorita Serrano noted that water figures provide an accurate indication. She stated that the 29,174 cubic metres consumed in June equates to 291,741 inhabitants. In July, it was 382,000, in August, 423,000, and so far in September, 297,000. So this year, we nearly reached half a million visitors and tourists, which are very high figures, she said. 
three and four star hotels in Torrevieja had occupation rates of 85% in July and August, while hotels, hostels and low classification ones had average rates of 63% for the same period. Registered tourist departments had a very good year, with rates reaching 85% for both months. In a press conference on Tuesday, the Deputy Mayor noted that the way in which tourists search for information on their destinations is changing, and less people are attending the traditional tourism offices. For example, more than 7,500 7, people use the 24-hour touchscreens, which can be found in the offices, and many look for information via tourism websites on the internet. She says despite this, a total of 11,000 people visited the Torrevieja tourism offices June, July and August, with 65% of those hailing from other countries. Amongst international visitors, the consultations made by British visitors are still the highest, now closely followed by the French. The guided routes which were laid on for the La Mata Torrevieja Natural Park were fully booked throughout the summer, and the new trip to the salt works on the tourist train is also providing very popular, she added. Now, I've heard about the tourist train to the salt works, and uh, it seems that it's doing really well there, and uh, quite interesting, I-, I would have thought, for most people. Uh, we're now going to go on to uh, the bike race, the Viota de España. Um, uh, as we do know from, uh, from when I said it last week, that the Viota de España will actually start from the Torrevieja area next year. So let's get on to that one in a little bit more detail. So uh, it is noted by the president of the Alicante province, Cesar Sanchez, when he went to Madrid on Sunday for the awards ceremony, he said that it was an honour for Alicante to be chosen as the launch point for the next edition of the prestigious race, which is beamed around the world. He reminded that the cyclists will be setting out from the historic salt works at Torrevieja Lake, and will then pass through the whole of the province. He noted that two stages of the race will take place in Alicante, running along the coast and through the mountains of the province. He says we are complete, completely committed to helping the organisers of the race, and we will start work immediately on our preparations for this great sporting event. He also noted that this is the first time the race has started in Torrevieja in its long history. He says it's a unique opportunity to promote the province, as a destination for tourism, we'll be able to show off our most spectacular areas to the whole world. Now, I do know that the last time the the Vierta de España came through the region, it was a very, very exciting place to be. Everybody went down to the N332 down by uh, the Punta Premier area and watched the racing go through. And I do know that there are quite a few people uh, in the area on Dream Hills 2 and Dream Hills itself, which are interested a lot in cycling. So that's great news for anybody who wants to do that. But be aware that uh, the area could be really, really busy. Uh, it is around the August time that it's held. So uh, just be careful of that. Uh, it may delay you uh, going around the, the province itself uh, and especially around the Salt Works area, obviously because uh, that's where the actual Vuelta de la Spagna will, will start its its process. So just be aware of that uh, if you've got anybody coming over or, or you're coming over around that time. It's uh, nearly over there then for this week. Uh, just a, a couple of more little things we're going to be talking about. Uh, it's a Costa, well, a Costa cash cow. Um, they're saying that the Oroel Costa is becoming a, a cash cow for the Oroel um, city itself uh, so we'll get on to that one in a minute and then the last bit will be a, a little bit of a spat between Ryanair and Norwegian so uh, it's basically the, there's the Oroella Costa they're saying that they are a, a cash cow for the Oroella town hall itself basically more than 38% of the taxes paid to the Oroella town hall treasury are contributed by us on the Oroella Costa even though the area only has 26% of the official registered population. These are the findings of the Federation of Residents Association for Oruela Costa, the FAOC. The FAOC members compiled a comprehensive study of income and expenditure in the 2018 budget and made a comparison with the registered population. 
the real estimated population based on water bills and property tax figures and building licensing fees. The association said 40% of income from IBI and capital gains tax and 80% of income from the building licenses came from Orella Costa. And now we do know most probably that the Orella Costa itself, which includes all of us on the, at the coast, does provide a lot of money to the Orwella town itself. Uh, and it just proves that uh, you know we don't get what we're paying for on the Orwella Costa. Um, so from the little bit of news that I said earlier about maybe splitting from Orwella Town Hall, then that may provide us with some uh, some better funding and everything else. Um, I don't think it'll happen. I don't think we'll get a split from Orwella Town itself. But you never know. Uh, this is Spain after all. And uh, no one thought that Brexit would happen either. So uh, on to the last bit of news uh, about uh, Ryanair Norwegian having a bit of a spat. Basically, it's where uh, Michael O'Leary, uh, as we all know, uh, the boss of Ryanair, um, he claimed that uh, Norwegian would go bust this winter. Uh, but a spokesman for the Scandinavian carrier accused Mr O'Leary of being a broken record and insisted his comments have no root in reality. He's saying that Norwegian has shaken up the long-haul market by offering flights at knockdown prices, with some of its popular deals including £99 trips from Edinburgh and Dublin to New York. But it has struggled to contain costs amid its rapid exp- expansion and had around two billion of net debt of last year. Mr Lariri claimed that he's shocked it's still flying, as it loses heroic sums of money, and predicted that it would go bust this winter. Now we all know Norwegian hasn't, but we also know that the all the airlines now do have around about three different classes for travelling. Um, even on the big big carriers, uh, British Airways, Virgin, they, they all do it now, where you can have a, a cheap flight to the US, um, but you can then take your hand luggage. And if you want to take any uh, big 23 kilo bags for the hold, then you have to pay extra. So they're all doing it. They're all having three classes anyway. Um, and uh, the, the Norwegian spokesman says that they're focusing on their business and it's about time that Mr O'Leary should focus on Ryanair. Now, with all the strikes going on with Ryanair, I can see Norwegian's point there. You know, Mr. Leary, he, he does really need to concentrate on his own airline at the moment. Um, and, and they asked Ryanair, actually, would they be interested in making a move? Well, Mr. Leary replied that he wouldn't touch Norwegian with a barge pole. Well, you know, if you've got cheap flights to the US, Mr. Leary, then you most probably, you, you might actually decide to, to go in with uh, Norwegian. Uh, but with this little spat going on, I don't see that happening. Well, that's it for this week. Um, it's been a long one, but uh, I wanted to get a few things crammed in as quickly as I could. Uh, as I said, uh, I am out uh, on October the 14th for a week. Uh, I would like to try and get some interviews with some businesses, if at all possible. If anybody would uh, like to contact those businesses for me, get back to me on the Dream Hills podcast at btinternet.com and then I can arrange a, a meeting with those businesses to have a little chat. That would be really nice. And uh, thank you all again for listening. Um, I hope you're all well and all safe after all the storms you've had there. And I'll speak to you again next week and uh, hopefully some more news uh, around the Brexit. Thank you again for listening and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.